All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Koontz. I am here today with Whitney Harper. She is uh, from a law firm called Advos, and their, strat their, their theme is advocacy and strategy, which is where their super crafty name comes from. Um, <laughs> if you've been joining us, you've seen Whitney before. We work with her and her firm quite a bit. Um, they have a great team and they work similar to the way that we do. So as always, we appreciate you joining us um, today. We are going to talk to you about intellectual property concerns within your business. Um, I know that we see it a lot on our end and frequently when it comes up, we ship folks over to Advos so that they can um, get their advocacy and strategy about their intellectual property. <laughs> Um, let me just note that uh, you're welcome to ask questions. If you'll kindly please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, that makes it easy for us to monitor. And if you um, need anything from Whitney, we'll provide her contact details at the end so that you can reach her and her team at her firm. So without further ado, how are you? I'm so good. I'm so good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course. Of course. And I just noticed I was looking at the participant list. We owe a shout out to Mindy Wells as Hi, Mindy. for the introduction. <laughs> without, without Mindy, we wouldn't know each other. Um, so hi, Mindy. Thanks for being here. Um, Mindy did a great job of saying, I was complaining about something that I needed. And she was like, do you not know Whitney? Like, like there was something wrong with me. Like, how do you not know Whitney? And I was like, I don't know. Where, like this manna from heaven, please introduce me. And Which, by the way, is the same way I was introduced to my business partner, Gwen. <laughs> I reached out to someone and they said, do you not know Gwen? <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> no, please, please fix me. I'm all broken. <laughs> the best ones. So, so yeah. Intellectual property stuff, I think is something easy for people to say, I'm not worried about that. I don't, I don't yeah. have, I didn't invent anything. I don't have any intellectual property and oh, how wrong are people? It's, you know, it's so interesting. Um, People think about the assets in their business. And I think particularly um, businesses that are um, asset heavy, right? So businesses with real estate or machinery or equipment or like actual product. Um, I think that the business owners sometimes will think about the assets in their business in a very tangible way. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy, particularly if you were the one who came up with the intellectual property. Uh, you, we all like... We all sort of discount the value of the things we create, right? Like, oh, it must not be that great. I did it. Like, that's <laughs> nothing. Um, and then you take a step back and you realize, like, actually, it's a big part of why people are interacting with your business, why your business is profitable, why, why your business is known as the go-to in your field. Um, and so that, that intellectual property is often the most valuable piece of your business. And at the same time, it's the least visible and the least understood, right? And so it's a really important thing for us to talk about early on with business owners um, because no matter what you plan to do with your business, if you're thinking about the sale of your business down the road and exit, right? Whether it's two years from now or 20, mm -hmm. um, or if you just wanna be able to run your business really well and have it be profitable, um, kind of stake your claim to some territory that, that you have established for yourself where your competitors um, really don't have a way to come after you, right? All of those things are kind of grounded in your ability to identify and own and protect your intellectual property. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. I see it all the time in the transactional world when we help someone buy or sell a business right? The buyer says, okay, so I need to know that you own your intellectual property. And the seller says, of course I do. It's right here in my business. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those areas where that could not be further from the truth, right? <laughs> it's IP is it, like, it's such a slippery thing. And in a lot of instances, um, you think you have paid someone to create the IP for you and ergo you own it. And it's actually quite the opposite, that you, you own a nice little license to use it, uh, but somebody else owns the real thing and, um, and you've got a problem. And so what we want to try to do is, whether it's preparing for a sale or uh, just preparing for a lifetime of a really strong business, um, we want to help business owners 
recognize the IP they have, um, understand how to make sure they own it mm -hmm. and protect it as they go and, and understand that it, it evolves. And so you're protecting it in this sort of life cycle. Um, but we want to do that early in while we are not in a situation where someone gets to hold us hostage, right? Because that's always fun when you go to sell a business and, you know, the person who you paid two grand to create some branding for you or whatever is now holding a $20 million transaction hostage mm -hmm. um, with dollar signs in their eyes. And, you know, that it can be avoided, but you have to think about it, you know, ahead of time, right? And, and it happens in so many different aspects. When you talk about the person doing the branding, that's the perfect example. And it, and everything along the way, even people that have created processes or systems that are your employees um, yes. who might want to stake a claim to say, well, I'm the one who came up with that. You know, if you're at NASA and you created something, it's very clear you don't own it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so much here. <laughs> right. Um, and it's kind of funny because you say like the NASA thing, we also see... Um, Clients who want to have a partnership with um, sometimes the university systems mm -hmm. are where we see this a lot, where uh, the university system has some intellectual property that is willing to, people think they're being sold the IP so that they can go develop it. Um, but those agreements often have some twists and turns in them that really mean that the university system or the hospital system uh, or whoever it is who holds this IP, who who has not yet figured out how to commercialize it is suddenly going to own all the commercial value of it. Um, or, you know, a, a very, very large percentage of it. Uh, they're going to own that. And it's, you know, it's right there in the documents. It's not like they're trying to hide it. Yeah. Um, but people, it's again, another instance of people make some big assumptions about intellectual property and about how, how a deal is going to go. Um, and IP more than most areas is one where it really, really matters what's in the document. And it's not an area of law where leaving it blank, like leaving it unsaid is going to be beneficial to you as the business owner who wants to hold the IP, right? There are some areas where like, you know, you kind of look at the situation and you go, I could either push the question and get a no, or I can just kind of let it ride and, and we can, call it a course of dealing down the road and, and say that, yeah, of course that was mine. <laughs> IP is not that. IP is yeah. not that, right? So um, for all the mavericks out there like me who, who kind of tend to like, eh, we'll roll the dice. This is not dice rolling territory. <laughs> this is, this is You're not, not in Vegas. <laughs> You're not in Vegas. You're not. Um, and it's so funny because I, you know, as a lawyer, like I'm, I, I think I'm supposed to be like not a dice roller. And, um, and so I, I struggle with this one too, right? Because yeah. it feels like, Hey, let's just have the person make the website. Like, let's just see if we can get that person to make a logo. No big deal. Potentially big deal. Potentially big deal. All right. So now we know why IP is important, right? Like we, we all kind of understand there's some stuff down there that if we don't figure it out in the beginning, we're gonna have a problem. But what is intellectual property? Like that is always the interesting thing to me. Uh, and I love hearing um, lay people, right? <laughs> this is the terrible thing that lawyers say. Like the world is divided into lawyers and non-lawyers. Um, but people who are in the business world who don't practice intellectual property law, even lawyers who don't practice intellectual property law, um, the concept of what is IP and what is not IP gets so like, so wobbly, right? And really, like if you think about it, anything that's not a fixed asset that is of any value to your business, you could sort of call intellectual property, right? It's, it's the intangible assets, the goodwill around all of those things, mm -hmm. right? But really, there are some categories of intellectual property. And, um, my partner, Gwen, who actually is an intellectual property lawyer. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you got the JV. You're, just, you're just playing one on TV. <laughs> I, I really, truly, I'm playing one on a webinar right now. Um, <laughs> so I, I will say I know a, a fair amount about intellectual property. And when, when it gets deep, like I love that I have a go-to in my, in my firm. It's great. Um, 
she once did this, um, one of those like personality assessments, right? Like Myers-Briggs or DISC or something. I don't know which one. And it was in a bigger law firm that had a big intellectual property law group, right? So you take 20 lawyers and you give them all the assessment and then you have them all sit by table according to their results. And you realize that all of the people who do trademark and copyright law and, and sort of that side of it are really like branding and marketing and salespeople at heart. And all the people who do patent are like math whizzes and engineers and they are like hard science people and like could not be more different, right? But we lump it all together as intellectual property. So you have sort of this marketing and branding side, and that is the trademark and the copyright. And then you have this kind of engineering hard science side, which is what we think about as patent, uh, and sometimes protected by trade secret, right? But it's really, it's that side that is kind of the, the science guts, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also intellectual property that doesn't necessarily get uh, protected through legal registration and that sort of thing uh, that isn't really a trade secret, right? It's, it's out there, it's obvious. And it's, it's part of your branding. It's, it's part of the systems and processes that you come up with. Um, you may not ever trademark it or like register it, but it's common law copyright or common law trademark. Um, and those things are very important in the business too, right? So you have this set of registrations trademark, copyright, patent. And then you have the unregistered stuff, trade secret and common law. Um, so we'll talk through those and just kind of some of the considerations about what they are, um, how you protect them, what the kind of what the risks and benefits are. Um, and if people have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, Joanne, I'll have to ask you to watch the question things. I'm terrible at it. Yes, like, no, I, I got you. <laughs> um, so trademark, right? That, I joke that trademarks are a gateway drug. Like, people, it, it's happening less lately, but it used to be that we would get calls all the time for people who were like, I need a trademark. And we would start talking with them and it turned out that there were like seven other really important, somewhat urgent things they needed to deal with before the trademark. Uh, you know, things like who owns the company, right? Like that, that was always like, let's, let's do that before we worry about who owns the trademark. Um, but trademarks are really important. And there are a lot of, um, a lot of misconceptions out there. It, it sounds very like, um, in, on the one hand, it sounds very like I can, I can DIY. <laughs> and on the other hand, uh, it, when you really get into it, you realize like how dangerous that could be. Um, it, truly you can do it yourself. Um, and the USPTO has a ton of guidance out there. The problem is if you're going to do it yourself to do it really well, you're going to spend a lot of time to understand exactly how all this works, how to, how to frame it up the right way, all those things. Um, and so I typically think, you know, people are better off have just finding the right lawyer to handle it and knocking it out. Um, because there's, there's some back and forth, there's some conversation you need to have, uh, some things to consider about how you're going to do that filing. There are two kinds of trademarks, generally speaking. So there's a word mark and a design mark. And a lot of people, um, whether it's an early stage of a business or an early stage of a new product line or an offering, um, a lot of people will want to, to protect the logo before they worry about the words and they've got it backward. Um, if you think about any, even a big brand, right? Like we we'll use Coca-Cola as an example here, just cause it's, it's well known, right? Coca-Cola has had different logos along, along the way, right? Over time. And, and at some point they settle in, right? At some point they've got like, here is the main Coke logo. But think about your own brand and your evolution, you probably have not kept the same logo for either your business or for various products um, in its exact form for very long, right? I know it, our firm, 
it's not like we've been around for decades, right? So we're, I think, six years in. And we've had, I think, four iterations of Logo, right? So, like, maybe we're a little nerdy about our logo. <laughs> we are it's certainly perfectionists um, and we do love a good um, graphic design, but uh, we also happen to know a wealth of people who do great work. And so it's that, it just makes it easy to like keep freshening. Um, but the freshening of a logo even, whether it's a big shift or something small, takes the thing you just protected and now you're not using it anymore. Now you've got a new iteration that you've got to go protect if you want to protect that one. So we often counsel people, protect the word before the logo. Okay. Um, so in our case, like we would protect Advos rather than the look of, you know, right now it's Advos in brackets. Um, because Advos is the name of the firm, that's not changing, right? But the, the way we design it to look um, from year to year might change. So if you protect the word, you want to protect the word early um, because trademark filings start a clock, <clears throat> right? So this is part of the reason why it's important to get it right the first time and, and why I encourage people to find a lawyer to help them with us. Um, when you do your trademark filing, you are saying you're sort of putting a, a line in the sand and saying from this date forward, I am protecting this word mark, right? And you're protecting it in a specific class of goods and services. So you're not just saying like, like when we protect Advos, it's not no one can use the word Advos for their product or service, right? If you wanted to go start a restaurant and call it Advos, I can't stop you. That's not competitive with me. That's not going to create in, in trademark land. Mm -hmm. We think about a likelihood of confusion. Right. So the restaurant called Advos, no one is going to walk up and go, wait a minute, I thought you could draft me a contract here. <laughs> Vice versa. Where's they're that not Maverick? <laughs> <laughs> they're not coming to my law firm and saying, hey, I want a pizza, right? Like that's, these are not, <laughs> that's not what's here. So in trademarks, you file in a particular class for products and services. And they're all numbered, right? Like for different types of things, just to kind of categorize them. And then you describe the product or service specifically, right? So, and it doesn't have to be like, I sell green leather jackets. It's like clothing for, you know, whatever. You are describing though, what it is that you are offering for sale. Um, and that's, that's another piece of it is you have to be offering something for sale. So you can't just say, Hey, um, I want to register my trademark for Advos, but I've, I'm, I'm not open for business yet. Yeah. Right? We get that a lot. People are like, I'm coming, but I have this great idea and I don't want to talk about it at a cocktail party. Yeah. And you can file what's called an intent to use trademark application, right? So you can say, Hey, I intend to be open for business soon. And I want to just go ahead and get on the record that this is the name I've picked, right? Um, you can do that, but then you still have to come back and say, okay, now I'm using it in commerce. And you've got to show specimens of the use of that word in commerce in connection with the product or service that is of the class that you chose when you filed. So when you see all of those things come together, you start to go like, oh, okay, I get why having like some help. <laughs> this sounds lawyerly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so what often will happen is somebody will say, well, I went ahead and filed it. And I just figured the lawyers can clean it up later. And so we go to sell the business and we look at the trademark filing and it's like, well, you know, it sort of covers the class of products that you sell, but not really. And we've got a few problems here, but it, you can't really just go back and amend them. Right. So what you end up doing is filing a new application in the proper class and now you own it from today forward but the 10 years you spent doing it with the you know with the trademark that hadn't been filed you sort of lost that protection so um you just you want to get it right from the start because you are you are establishing a history of ownership and of exclusive use 
Uh, and trademarks require continued filings. So there are some like within six year filings, there's some later filings than that, uh, where you have to kind of put out an affidavit saying, yep, I'm still using this name, right? Or this word mark or logo mark or whatever. Uh, so you can't just keep it forever and not use it. Um, it's, it's this funny thing where they're like, the trademarks are meant to be you know, used. And if you're not gonna use it, you can't just, you can't put baby in a corner, right? They're not having it. So, um, is there any truth to the old adage? I hear people banter around at cocktail parties and such where they say, oh, well, just throw TM at, on everything you do. And then that just automatically protects you. Yeah. So, um, yes and no. Perfect. <laughs> like better than like you're a lawyer or something. <laughs> better than most of what you hear at a cocktail party. This one's at least partially true. Um, common law trademarks which are trademarks that have not been registered with the USPTO, uh, you can protect them with that TM, right? And you often will see a TM that then turns into a circle R, right? So the circle R at the end of a trademark means it's been registered with the USPTO. The TM means it has not been registered. It may be that the application is in process, right? So we filed our application but we haven't gotten our certificate from the USPTO yet. And so we're just, we're putting the world on notice, right? It may not be, it may be that you're just- You went to the cocktail party. <laughs> and, I'm, and I've decided to do this for now, gotcha. right? Um, and you know, we do sometimes have people who say, I, I wanna just see if there's any traction for this product, right? Before I go spend money to file a trademark, I wanna find out if, if it's actually got legs, mm -hmm. right? totally fine. Um, there's, there's risk and reward, right? So you're going to delay your filing, which means you're delaying your record date for the trademark, but you're, you maybe are preventing yourself from spending some money that wouldn't have been necessary anyway, if the product doesn't have a, a following, right? Sure. So it's that, it's the risk reward that, that entrepreneurs and business owners have got to kind of weigh all the time. But yeah, the, the TM is a thing. <laughs> You'll also see SM for service mark. Um, so TM for generally like kind of goods and SM for services. Um, all right, so that's trademark. Copyright is um, probably a slightly shorter conversation lately because we just see less of it. Um, I think part of that is because publishing is now so easy right? Everything you put on a website can be shifted in a half hour, right? Like you decide a new blog, you post, here it is. I don't like the copy under my picture on our website. I'm going to change it. Um, I'm writing a white paper. I'm going to get it out there. I can self-publish, right? Like all of these things, even digital imaging, you think about uh, copyright protects images, words, artwork. And if you're the person out there taking pictures, a hundred years ago, like it was real hard to get a picture produced and out into the public domain, right? Today, it's almost hard to go a morning without doing it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, copyright registration, um, we really aren't seeing a whole lot of lately. I think there are still, you know, if, if you are in the um, art world, it's probably much more common. Um, but in business generally, what we find is that businesses are publishing a lot on websites and, um, you know, kind of digitally producing content and they are stamping it with, you know, the circle C copyright statement. Um, and they're, so they're going kind of common law copyright, um, rather than trying to like register a copyright. Registering a copyright does give you additional protections, um, but in most cases, what we find for businesses who are you know, growing and using copyrighted material as part of their marketing or sales support, that kind of thing, um, the, the registered copyright just isn't, it's not relevant, right? So what we say there is if you've got content out on your website, you want to make sure you're not violating somebody else's copyright. 
Mm -hmm. right? So uh, don't grab images that aren't yours without making sure that you can license them or that you're allowed to use them. Um, and often people will say, well, it's, you know, I've seen other people use them. Well, that's nice. That just means there's a bigger group of you to come round up. <laughs> um, using somebody else's copyright without permission is a very expensive proposition. And it is a, did you or didn't you do it question? It's not a, did you intend or did you profit mm -hmm. from it? Like it is, it's a lot of dollars and, um, and there are a lot of lawyers out there who will come after, you know, who've sort of paired up with a plaintiff who owns content. Um, and they will find that content on your website if you've used it. And even on your Twitter or your, like, we had one recently where um, there was a, a tweet that cost a client about 10 grand. Oh my gosh. Um, and it really, I mean, it was, it's like, it's unfortunate because it's, it was years ago and it was, um, it's just, a, it's a nothing you can do about a situation, right? Wow. You did it. They owned it. You're toast. Uh, so yeah, things like that, that you really want to be aware of, uh, making sure that if you're using words on your website, if you've got copy that you're, um, you know, somebody on your team created it or somebody who you paid to create it, that you've got the right to use it in perpetuity and that you can change it if you want to and those kinds of things. Um, so again, the agreements that you have with people become very important as does just having some good conversation with the people who handle your, your website creation, your marketing, whatever to say, Hey, I want to make sure that the content you're using is legit and that like, I'm not going to have a problem down the road. Um, we have a client right now who's selling a business who um, has this website that, you know, he and his team built. And um, so I'm, I'm going through the purchase agreement with him and we've got some reps and warranties about, he has to warrant to the buyer that he owns or has the right to use all of the content um, on the website. And so I'm looking at the website and I'm like, there's a, like kind of an unusually large number of photographs on this website. And um, like, do you know where they all came from? And you know, he's the business owner. I'm sort of expecting him to be like, I have no clue. Right? Like, I, I don't know, like somebody else did this for me. Thankfully, <laughs> he's like, well, that, that picture, the header, when you go onto the website, you know, there's a, like a picture of a guy surfing. It's like, yeah, cool picture. It's like, yeah, that's a picture of me. Like my wife took it. We're good. <laughs> it was actually like, it was the best answer possible that actually like he and, and like people on his team who all had assigned rights um, to the company actually did all the, all of this wow. photography. Right. But you really, you have to think about that. You also want to think about like, if you have pictures of, um, your operation, right. So often you'll see like a company that has photographs on the website of the team doing the work, right? Here we are manufacturing the, whatever here we are in our like cool workspace, right? All of those photos that have team members in them. You want to make sure that you've got the license to use those people's images for publicity. And that if they leave the business, that license is not revocable, right? So Jeez. like the person who's in that great shot that fits the header of your website perfectly, who, you know, moves on and then suddenly sends you a demand letter demanding that you take their photo off your website because they don't like you anymore that's a problem, right? Um, so it's just things like that, where you just want to make sure that you're, you're thinking through them. Um, because copyright is one of those that goes both ways, right? Um, and the right to publicity of your own image. Um, so we, we definitely think about, um, with all of this, and we'll talk about it a little in, in a little further down, um, you know, making sure that you're thinking through what goes in the kind of employee covenant agreement that you have your team sign, right? Just, just standard course. Like we own what you're creating and we, if we've got pictures of you doing the business, then you like, you've assigned us the right to use those and you can't revoke it and things like that, that just yeah. 
if you can get those things handled right at the start, then you never have to think about it again. So. Is it enough to keep like a digital copy of that? Can you just scan that to your server when someone signs off on it? Is an email yeah. enough? Yeah. Um, so what we tend to do everything by e-signature. Um, so of course our practice area allows for that, right? We're not doing things like wills that might require a, a wet signature. Um, but we do e-signature and we just keep digital copies of everything. And, um, and that is quite fine. Um, all right, so that's copyright. Patent um, is super specialized. You actually, so lawyers can't just like, hey, everything else in the law is, I went to law school and so I am like licensed to do all the areas, right? There's, I will say there's a professional responsibility code that says you shouldn't do the things that you aren't actually skilled at, um, but if I come out of law school, I have every right to try to go be a criminal lawyer or a family lawyer or a corporate lawyer. Uh, I can't go be a patent lawyer without an additional bar exam, right? And so people who are doing patent work, um, I'm not even gonna try to get into the details of it because it is, it is a really detailed area. Uh, and what and you, don't, say is, you don't sometimes in it. I'm definitely not a patent lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to play one on a webinar. <laughs> uh, but we are actually doing some work right now on a patent um, for my company. And what I will tell you is you want to take the time and get the recommendations to find the patent lawyer who can shepherd you through the process in a really good way. Um, that even means find somebody who can talk through what the, what the fees are going to be, right? How, what is this going to cost me over how many years? Like, what is this process? Uh, what really is protectable and what is not? Uh, how should I think about what I can, what I can unveil to people and when, um, you know, people, people have all sorts of preconceptions about how patent works. And it is a little different depending on the type of patent and what you really intend to do with it. Um, so I would just say like, spend the time early to find the team who can help you as a partner to you through that. Um, and not just like, I've got a lawyer who only, only <laughs> sits in their little box and I, you know, I'm only gonna talk to them a little bit. Um, you know how much I love that. So. <laughs> Just start you know, with a flashlight. That's that's my game. <laughs> yeah. So um, patent, like if you have a process, if you have a technique, or how you do what you do, if you have a particular formulation or um, like a mechanized thing, like th there's all sorts of different stuff that can be patented. Um, but the important thing is your patent is expressing or is protecting your particular execution or expression of the idea. So it's a very specific protection and it's public, right? So you're not hiding from anyone what it is that you're protecting. You're actually saying, here it is and it's all mine, right? But anything just to the left or just to the right isn't. So patent actually is one of those things where I think it's really important to have the conversation to say, is patent the right protection mm -hmm. for us? Um, in some instances, there is a ton of value in just being able to say, I have a patent on this, right? Because a buyer might be attracted to that or the customer who, um, you know, wants to feel like the thing they're, they're getting is specialized, finds that to be important. Even if someone could set up shop tomorrow and do something that is just a shade different and be perfectly within the rights to do that, the, the fact that you have a patent can be of tremendous value. And in that sense, the patent almost becomes a branding mechanism, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's less about the protection of the patent itself and more about the, like the bragging rights almost. Uh, but there are other things where 
um, you really are much better off thinking about protecting it as a trade secret. Mm -hmm. We go back to the Coca-Cola example. Um, Coca-Cola's recipe is not patented. However, I have tried all of the off brands of Coke and I can tell you, <laughs> nobody's quite got it. Right? <laughs> and growing up in the South, I can tell you RC Cola didn't get there. <laughs> so how is it that nobody has figured out, like we're all, we all grew up drinking Coke products, right? Like everybody has tasted it. I don't know how it is that nobody has been able to figure out the Coke formula, right? It's because Coke has treated it as a trade secret. So bless you. Thanks. <laughs> and being attacked by the pollen in Florida. It's very I love oak pollen. It's That's like, please put more oak trees by my office. Yes. Um, so Coke has a secret recipe. And my understanding is like there are, very few people in the world who have access to the entire thing, right? So you, you compartmentalize and you think about putting people under strict agreements as to secrecy. You put policies and procedures in place. You put sort of double checks, right? All of those, all of those things that help not just, we do a lot of things in business where we see people say, I've got an agreement in place, right? Like I checked the box, but trade secret is not a check the box area, right? This is not just, I had the person sign the agreement that says they're gonna treat it like a secret. This, you actually need to police it. Like this has to be real. And so if you wanna protect something as a trade secret, you are making sure that your employees or anybody who has access to it understands that it, you know, to whom it can be communicated, right? So it may be people within this department, but not that department, or people at this level, but not that level. Wow. Or um, we're gonna allow this kind of third party contractor to know about it because they need to work on it, but nobody else gets to, right? You wanna be super specific about it because Trade secret is not, this is not a, I registered it with a governmental organization and so it is mine. Trade secret is like, I actually kept it a secret and that is how no competitor got it, right? So that is how like everybody and their brother tries to stand up a soft drink to compete with Coke and like, Meth. right? <laughs> so, Trade secret is actually a, a, an evolving area of the law in this regard. Um, and a lot of companies have seen this start happening in their agreements. There is a, um, a fairly recent development in the law called the Defend Trade Secrets Act, DTSA. And it gives companies better protection of trade secrets, but there's some language that you need to add to agreements in order to access that better protection. Um, so if you are protecting things with trade secret, you probably want to talk with your lawyer about um, making sure that you've got the right language in your agreements so that you actually can take advantage of the increased protections that are out there under the DTSA. Um, and it's language that goes in NDAs and in anything with like confidentiality protections for trade secrets. Um, so all of those things are sort of the, the mechanisms we use for protecting and registering and kind of declaring the ownership of our IP. Um, but there's also another piece you have to do, which is make sure you own it. So I mentioned several times in the beginning of our chat uh, that IP is a little backward. If, for instance, you have somebody developing software code for you or building your website or creating logos or writing copy or developing your recipe, right? Whatever it is, mm -hmm. if somebody is creating intellectual property for your business, um, you don't, it, particularly if they are an independent contractor, right? If they're, if they're not your employee, 
uh, you don't necessarily own it just because they created it for you. And what I mean by that is you may own a license to use it, but not the actual full ownership of it. And the right, for instance, to prohibit them from um, licensing it to other people or you know, selling it to someone else or whatever. So what you wanna do is make sure that in your agreement with that person before they start the work, um, and if you've already had them start the work, then you want an agreement that explicitly says, we're going back to the dawn of time <laughs> and anything you've ever created for us falls under this, um, that you own it, they don't. And if, if, for instance, they say, well, I would like a license to, I'd like the right to, to display it on my website as an example of my work or I'd like to be able to create derivatives of it for other parties or whatever. You should talk through those things. And then, you know, if you're comfortable with the way they want to use it and, and you're clear about whether or not they need to pay you to do that or whether or not you have a right to um, revoke that license, then you could draft those things into the agreement as well. But what you really want to make sure of is that you own it um, outright. Also important in employee agreements, and whether it's an employee or a vendor, uh, you know, independent contractor, I think about putting in language about the ownership of the intellectual property they might create. Um, the fact that they don't, they don't have a right to control whether you can make changes to it, whether you can profit from it, any of that, they don't have a right to um, essentially royalties on it. Um, publicity, so we talked about, you know, for employees in particular, the right to use their image or their voice or their name um, in your materials and not to have to change that because they've decided to revoke it. Mm -hmm. uh, note that there, you may have some people who, who aren't comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, and so and that, that becomes a discussion between the business owner and the employee and, and may just be something that you have to sort of understand. Like this person does not want to be on our website, does not want their name out there, whatever. And so we have to, we just have to draw some lines. Um, but better to have that conversation on the front end than after you've done a whole bunch of work and paid somebody to take the pictures. Um, so ownership of the intellectual property, confidentiality, um, and making sure in your confidentiality agreements that you are protecting trade secrets forever. Um, often we'll see like an NDA where somebody says, I really only need to protect stuff for like a couple years, right? Like after two years, it's, it's stale information. Um, that is probably true for most of your confidential information. It's likely untrue for your trade secrets. So long as they're still trade secrets, right? As long as nobody else knows it yet, it's probably still pretty valuable to you. And so you want that indefinite protection for trade secrets. Really important. So that is like so many words. That's a lot. So many words. What are the most common issues that you see people not, like when you said earlier, and I, I know from conversations you and I have had in the past, people call and say, you know, uh, uh, I'm having chest pain and really they need their leg cut off. Like when you talk to a small business and they're concerned about something else, what are, what is the most common two or three things that you think people overlook? Um, you know, in intellectual property, I think, um, the, the trademark as the gateway drug really is true. Like people come yeah. in, they want, they want to trademark a logo and, um, they aren't, you know, they, they haven't yet started doing business. Okay. And they haven't thought about trademarking the words first and they're not clear about who owns the business yet. Gotcha. Right. And so that's like, that's often the scenario where it's like, I have this great idea and it's because people truly like, it's the, like the, I woke up this morning and, and here was the revelation I had had while I was sleeping and it's genius and I don't want anyone to get it. Right. Well, going to get a patent on a thing is like a, that's a process. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so nobody wakes up and goes, patent this right now. <laughs> <laughs> this, right? And they know it. Trademark feels a little, I think it feels a little more accessible and, and so people um, kind of tend toward that. But you know, the other thing that we see a lot is just um, businesses not having third-party vendors, right? 
right? So think about for your graphic design for your logo or your, uh, like often it'll be like a, a diagram or some sort of illustration of the special way you do business, right? Where like, there's really some thought that goes into that. It's not, it's not just like, I want an X here and an O there. It's like, we have to really think about the psychology of who's trying to, to take in this information and what's going to sway them and what do they need to know and all of that. And you're putting all of that together and, and you get this great graphic or even some copy about how that all goes. And they pay the person and they move on. And they actually didn't look at the person's agreement or there might not have been an agreement. Um, and so they're thinking, well, I mean, I, they, I didn't sign anything with them. So they, of course they don't own it. And obviously that's, it's backward, right? So I think those are the two things. It's like the starting point on trademark and then just getting, um, getting clear lines of ownership around things from the start, particularly when you're working with third parties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing that, that we don't hear a lot about, but that I feel like a lot of people miss is trade secret. Uh, I think there are a lot of businesses out there that have sort of discounted mm -hmm. what they do and you know, the value of it. And if they really thought hard, um, and you know, we, we have this conversation a lot, just kind of stepping back, what is it that is your secret sauce, mm -hmm. right? Like what is the thing that makes you different and how much of that has to be exposed to the world in order for you to go be different and do, do things differently versus how much of it um, could we keep secret and really build, you know, a, a serious fortress around your business. Um, but I think that's almost one of those things that happens just because business moves so quickly, mm -hmm. right? And people are moving and shaking and, and things are going well. And, um, and so yeah, it, it, it happens, but once your trade secrets out there, it's out there. There's no pulling it back. So we see that with the website people, you know, third party content or bloggers or people that are contributing a chart or a graph or, you know, um, some visual aid with some frequency to say, yes, you know, that, oh, can you, can you do this so I can put it up with the blog story? Oh yeah, I'll make an infographic. And it's like, oh, maybe there's, maybe you should be careful about who's making that. Maybe it shouldn't be your third party content manager. Yeah. It, maybe it should be, and you just need the, the agreement because that's, that's something I could see happening a lot that people aren't mindful of. Yeah. Well, and you know, the example I gave of the client who had the, um, the copyright infringement issue, mm -hmm. that was social media, right? Okay. It was, I mean, their, their business was social media and so they were more prone to it, but I think we're going to see a lot more companies where, you know, they are, letting their team do a takeover of their social media for the day, or they just are retweeting or they're, they're just not being careful about their own posts. Um, and so you, you end up, oh, I'm going to grab this, you know, picture from whatever and, and put it behind my motivational quote, right? Great idea until somebody else owned that picture. Um, so just like, I, I feel like we're going to see more issues like that pop up just because of the, prevalence and ease mm -hmm. of social media. I mean, it's so easy to screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> it just really is. And, and really uh, the, the other thing to your point is the, the breadth of industry. So this could be like yeah. a realtor with an assistant who said, Hey, put up my, you know, motivational quote of the day or, you know, something yes. like that. It doesn't need to be a big business operation for you to get in trouble. It could be we little just me. In with fact, you know, a part-time, you know, high school assistant. This one was a guy who had um, opened, basically bought a, almost a franchise, but a little, a little business for his, like, young adult son to run, right? It was a two and a half person operation. Oh, man. Yeah. So really, I mean, it, you don't have to be big to have a target on your back in that regard. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad we talked to you. Yes. <laughs> this is awesome.
<laughs> it's Oak Trees and Whitney today. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> like a one-two combo. <laughs> oh, we'll, go, we'll break now and I'll go check our social media. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But seriously, you know, I see a lot of realtors with the with the posts and um, you know, even if it's a picture of, you know, something from the beach that maybe somebody else took. Like, oh, look at this great sunset from yeah, you know last night at Siesta Key or something like that. So right. it's tempting because it's just pretty, but. Right, yes. And you'll see sometimes um, people will say like, please don't reuse without my permission and that kind of thing. And there are also licenses where um, you're allowed to reuse it. Like people will let you reuse it for personal use, mm -hmm. but not for commercial use. Right. And so a lot of businesses will say, well, I mean, I just posted on social media. Like that's not commercial. I'm not selling anything. Oh yeah, you are. Yeah, it's you are. Friends and Associates on that social media page. <laughs> that's right. So, so you're hoping somebody looks at that and then comes and buys something from you. That's commercial use. Wow. So just watch out for those as well. Um, really, really important. Yeah. Wow. I, I, you know, for somebody who's pretending to be an IP lawyer on, on a webinar, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you've really, um, you've really scared us off. Thank you. As yeah. you know what though, I always tell people, cause some, sometimes we get into these kind of topics and they are overwhelming or they get bigger than people expect. Like I'm sure people thought like, Oh, I'm just by myself. This, this doesn't probably yeah. apply to me, but it really does. Um, and it's easy to make these assumptions and we sometimes see people like, oh, that's like, we've made it overly complicated. And it's like, no, this is why, you know, when we see it with homestead issues in Florida where people are like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden there's this, you know, what do you mean I owe the government $62,000 because my wife moved from Indiana? Well, yeah, you've, she had a homestead up there and you've been illegally claiming it for four years. Like, yeah, that's, that's how it goes. And yeah. like you said, just because something is small or simple, doesn't mean that um um that that you're that you're you know enough to get into trouble but maybe not enough to get out we yeah. do have one one question that says if if you were to reuse a picture um that was published can you say i don't own rights to this photo and have that help in any way i mean it might make the person less mad at you um <laughs> but no i think legally that's probably not going to not to going to do you to protect you other than actually create um a, an admission right gotcha. so if somebody comes after you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you knew you were doing it you even <laughs> said so <laughs> uh, no, i think it's a really great question because i actually do see that sometimes like i don't own the rights to this ps whatever if the person who took originally took the photo has said like you can use this with a credit to me mm -hmm and a link back to my bio, right? Then generally, like if you do what they say and you reuse it that way, then generally that's okay. But the blanket, like I don't own this photo, isn't really gonna save you from anything other than, you know, save you a breath when someone wants to ask you, wait, did you know that you were using someone's photo that wasn't yours? And, and oh, oh it yeah. looks like you yeah. did. <laughs> yeah, that. Um, so yeah, let's, let's avoid the ad admission. Uh, <laughs> Let's at least keep them guessing. Right. <laughs> Perfect. No doubt. Perfect. No doubt. I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate your time. That's I know you're man. super busy, but you're always super helpful. And um, we love we love the opportunity to hear from you and your team. And we love working with you. So Thanks. thank you so much. Um, everyone, we will, of course, as always, be recording this webinar and circulating it so you can catch it on our social media that is not stolen from anywhere else. <laughs> you can use this on your page. Um, <laughs> uh, you can go to coonsassociates.com, coonsparkin.com, our YouTube channel, or our Facebook pages to grab the recording in case this was so riveting you want to do it again or share it with a business owner who maybe missed this and will be kicking themselves for having done so. Next week, we are gonna be talking about, we're switching our focus to real estate transactions. We're gonna be talking about closing costs and credits. Um, these days, there's a lot of lender um, transactions going on right now because interest rates are so low. So even folks who previously paid cash are now taking loans. And I'm seeing lots of um, wobbly stuff coming in um, our way where it's like, well, yeah, you can, you, you can or can't say that because the way the, you know, the wording is important because there's a lender involved and we don't want to 
give the buyer perception that they're getting a credit that maybe doesn't come to fruition because of limitations and things like that. So we're going to explore that world next week. Um, and uh, if you have any, if you have ideas or, or issues that you'd like to hear about, you're always welcome to email us your suggestions and we'd be happy to bring you the content you want to hear. So thank you so much, Whitney, and we'll see you guys next Tuesday.